Welcome to Product Stories, where we explore how founders build successful software products. This is a podcast about product management, development, remote work, and anything else non-technical as well as technical founders need to know to launch and scale software products. Today's guest is Robin Warren, who is the founder of Corello and Blue Cat Reports. Both SaaS products are based around Trello. We'll talk about how he got started by building quick six-week prototypes to find a product that sticks and how he scaled from there. Robin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us on. Oh yeah, uh, my pleasure. Uh, I've been wanting to do this for a long time because you have some really interesting uh, insights to share. But firstly, uh, let us know what your what your background is. How did you get into uh, wanting to build a SaaS, into entrepreneurship? What what did you do before? Yeah, sure. So I was a software developer um, for a long time, and then ended up sort of managing a small team. So I started at a, a small company. I always seem to be employee number seven, every company I joined for some reason, I'm not sure. But then yeah, stayed at one and ended up sort of managing the team there. I think that experience of working at a small company that was growing kind of got me a bit more excited about um, startups and wanting to get involved in that kind of thing. Um, and then I'm not sure when I saw, I remember seeing like Patrick McKenzie building, um, the bingo card creator and stuff like that. And then sort of finding Rob Walling and people like this and get included in the idea that you could actually just do it yourself. You didn't need to do it as part of a company. You know, you didn't need to raise funds. You could just go out and build something and sell it. And that was, you know, fitted in with what I like doing, which was building things. So I spent a long time building things and not actually releasing them or getting close to making any money. And then gradually started actually releasing some things, but not making any money. And then, um, yeah, from there sort of jumped into, I guess the story we'll, we'll get into um, later. But yeah, fairly typical developer discovered that you could just, you know, in theory, just sit in a darkened room programming and somebody would post money under the door and be like, yeah, that sounds nice. I'll try and do that for a business for a life. including myself uh, as, a, as a developer who's always wanted to build a SaaS. And then you're like, but what, what should I actually build? Um, should, should be the easiest part, right? Shouldn't it? Um, and uh, so as I, as, I, as I know, you at some point said, okay, no, I'm actually gonna, gonna jump into that. Uh, what, what did you? Yeah, so I had a, um, so I was working at this company I've been working at for about 11 years and the opportunity for redundancy came up um which i mean basically it, it sort of got to this place it needed to get to i think and then they just needed to cut back and and try and sell the business so as quite a senior person they were fairly happy to get rid of me because i was expensive um and that was great so i took a fairly decent return redundancy payment from there not amazing but it was like a decent chunk of cash um i had some money saved up um that was the same month my first daughter was born my first kid was born um i sort of left there so i had about a month off paternity leave and then got down to work trying to build something. It was unusual, I guess, in that a lot of people would recommend you don't go full time until you've built something on the side and started getting some momentum. But for me, I'd been kind of doing it evenings and weekends and I'd I'd sort of burnt myself out on that really of like, you know, I was working on the commute to work on the train. I was working in the evenings, sort of a few evenings a week. I was working weekends whilst my um my wife was out sort of hanging out with our friends and stuff like this. And I was like a, I've kind of had enough of that and having to really rush everything and sort of not, you know, building a lot of technical debt rather than sort of building sort of decent quality code and not really having time for conversations with customers as much as I'd want. Um, and also with a, like a kid on the way, I was like, well, my evenings are going to be shot and my weekends need to be for the family, not for building stuff. You know, I can't just take 12 hours on a Saturday now. So I decided to go full time without any clue of what I was going to build um, at that point. I had a couple projects which were out and had some users but which weren't making a lot of money or making i think no money one of them may have, may have made a little bit a lot of the time then somebody would offer me 30 dollars or something but they'd be the only person who did and i'd be like well i don't want to take your money because then i have to work out how to deal with having earned some money outside of my job <laughs> so i just give it stuff to them for free you know unless you're going to get like 10 people it's sort of not interesting so i tried a few sort of revs of different ideas there i tried a, a jobs board you know back in the day i had a jobs board um i looked at contractors i didn't consider remote and i wish i had because obviously this would be a different conversation i'd be in my like solid gold palace right now right with my remote jobs board that i'd automated um so i tried a few revs on that um and then a sort of a chance conversation a friend good friend in bristol 
wanted some sort of tech advice. He was looking to hire someone maybe for his business, which is a content marketing agency. So I said, well, you don't want to hire me because I'll be quite expensive and I want to do my own thing, but I'll come over for a day and look at all the things you're thinking of building. Um, and we can sort of have a look, okay, which of them could be solved by tech? Which ones should you just buy? And which ones, you know, you need to get a human in to do that because it's not really solvable. So he could look at like, okay, if, he, if there's products that he could be producing, um, I could sort of help him with that. And then maybe a bit of like scoping so we could go and hire someone. Um, and one of the issues he had was around Trello um, and getting reporting out of that. And he was telling me that him or his colleague was spending maybe four hours a week just getting data out of Trello. So I sat there, then I went back home and then I carried on digging into all the ideas I was trying to look into for another 24 hours. Then suddenly I thought, hang on, <laughs> someone has got a problem. It's got a problem with Trello. And then I went and sort of prototyped something on that. So it, like, a couple of days later, I took a prototype to him and was like, okay, this is what I could do for you. Would you pay money for this? And sort of got into that kind of more traditional um, customer interviews and, you know, mum test kind of validation conversations at that point. You built for him at that point. So I built something that worked just on my machine. Um, it was a single web page. It opened up. So he, he was having issues um, as an agency. He had a Trello board for multiple for each um, customer he worked with. Um, and then he had a lot of freelancers who were doing the work. And what he was doing every week or his colleague was doing every week were going in and just working out, has a freelancer somewhere missed a deadline, missed updating something. So they were going through maybe 30 boards um looking at all these cards that were active and trying to work out if something had been missed um so i built something that just showed across your 30 boards here are all of the ones which all of the cards which are overdue all the ones which are due in the next week um and just sort of gave like some big numbers and a, a list of cards but that was literally all they they needed really you know there's a couple of tweaks on top of that but yeah cool so that was your initial prototype uh he was happy with that and I guess now we were like, okay, more customers. How, how did you go about that? Yeah, well, so first off, I had to get a version of it that worked off of my computer because that one literally just worked on my machine. Um, so I had to deploy that live um, and get it working for someone else. So that, I mean, that probably took a few more days at least to get something that they could actually use. Um, and then, yes, so I was like a week in at that point. So, I, I mean, so yeah, started looking for other customers, but also I think it's worth mentioning like the emotional state I was in, I guess, you know, I had, I had a load of money. I had enough money potentially for being a family to go for a year on this, but I didn't want to spend all of the money on that. So in my head, I was like, we need to like get some progress after six months. I, I think it, um, if you'd asked me then I would have said in six months time, I'm going to be making a living off of this. We might just be scraping a living, but it'll be enough to live on. Um, which doesn't give you a lot of time to invest in my, my attitude had always been, Try something, try it fast, fail, and then try the next thing. Which so I was going to start up events then, and sort of you know sort of trying to meet people who were using Trello, um, and get introductions and see if anybody was interested in trying this stuff out. Um, it's a lot of big sort of creative scene in Bristol. So if you go to start up events, there's a reasonable chance you'll meet some other marketing or design agencies who might be using Trello. So that was my idea. But I'd turn up and sort of say like, oh, this is the current thing I'm working on until I until it fails and then I'll work on something else. And people would chastise me saying I should be more confident and how it's going to change the world. And you've got to go around, you know, which a hundred percent, not my attitude. So I was like, let's work as fast as we can. So I got something working for uh, my friend, Tom, I got something working then that could work for multiple people so they could create different accounts and this sort of thing. I got an introduction through him to someone he knew who might be interested. I started contacting, um, people I knew who were using Trello, but that, that was sort of a fairly thin number of people basically so, so then it was down to looking on twitter is there anyone i know in bristol who fits sort of the similar profile or emailing groups there was like a, an email list for um creative types in bristol that i was on so i emailed that and got a couple introductions um you know putting tweets out asking people to retweet it but also just at you know just pinging people just going and at mentioning being like hey um you know i met you at such and such do you use trello do you know anyone who uses it i'm building a product and trying to sort of get some validation. I got some com conversations out of that. Um, I didn't get much in the way of interest. I got to say, I got, um, after Tom, I got one other, um, person that he introduced me to using it, but they were pretty lukewarm on it. I would say, um, I emailed my old mailing list for the other products I'd, that I just decided to kill. I sort of emailed them and said, Hey, by the way, 
thanks for coming along for this. I'm not working on this tool anymore, but I am working on this other one over here. If you're anyone you know uses Trello, come and check it out. I got one person who signed up who was keen on it and used it, but never converted to being a paying customer. And I, I have to admit, I really struggled at this stage of like, going and finding people and validating it. And I don't know if it's um, all of or one of, like I suck at that maybe. Um, it's hard to do that when you're looking for Trello users who have a specific reporting requirement because it's kind of a, you know, it's sort of a Venn diagram with that is a bit hard to track down. So I, I was going along to sort of marketing events with a hundred people at, and you go around and do your best of talking to everyone and you meet three people who are using Trello. And I was like, I thought everyone in here would be using Trello, but it just wasn't the case. And those three people then, you know, you need to convert a very high number of them to get um, to get one of them onto a trial and convince that they actually want to to buy it. You know what I mean? I think that that is that is a part which I, yeah, part of the journey that I went through and I can't say I really nailed at the time. And I think I would struggle again if I went through it because it's, it's really hard trying to sell a product that doesn't exist yet, that you don't know what it's meant to be to a group of people that you don't necessarily know how to find. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's totally shooting in the dark. So I don't, I'm not surprised. Uh, I've I've tried that a few times myself back then, and it I didn't put that much effort in as you did, which is probably why that never went anywhere because the <laughs> beginning looks exactly like it. And um, I guess what it took is to mainly just validate that idea, but then get one clue into the right direction. Yeah, uh, and just talk to as many people as you could whatever way possible to to get that clue yeah i mean I, I think the thing i had all the way through that sort of period was like it was like okay this one person really loves it and there's a lot of people using trello and this seems like a fairly obvious problem they can't be the only one it's just i'm not finding a sort of scalable way of getting people or not even a scale. I'm just not finding people who feel it to the same degree, but I'd kind of set myself a limit on that. So I sort of said, look, six weeks and I was doing a mix of building and outreach and trying to sort of get conversations with people. And towards the end of that six weeks, it was pretty obvious. I was not really finding people through this kind of, um, in the trenches sort of one-on-one -on -one kind of approach of finding people. So, um, I'd met somebody at one of these meetups though, who was a journalist, freelance journalist and worked for the next web. And he was interested in doing a, a write up of it um, when I was ready to launch. So that was great. So I got that article written and I went on Product Hunt. And luckily, Product Hunt, at least then, it's not always worked out like that for me, but at least then was um, a good place for launching things that work with Trello. There's quite a lot of Trello people in there. And there's a lot of people, obviously, everyone in there is keen on trying something new out. So I managed to end up in like the sort of top five or six, I think. And I was, I was doing quite well throughout the day. And then San Francisco wakes up and somebody with some stupid T-shirt joke, like takes the top spot or whatever. But like I got a couple thousand trials in the space of a few days from um, those two those two efforts, basically. And I think I probably did a show HN as well, which is probably on the front page for a little bit. So I got a bunch of people in and it was like, OK, this is this is the opportunity. If these people don't convert, then this isn't an idea that I can really run with. I need to go and try something else. And it's not to say it's like a bad idea. It wouldn't work. It's just like, I don't know how to make it work. So I need to go and try a, an, another idea, which maybe I can make work. Um, and that was when I almost completely killed everything, basically, because I got 2000 people signed up and I got one customer, um, which was disappointing because I'd already picked out the color of the second and the third Tesla at that point. But um, yeah, I can talk a bit about what went on because that was a critical two weeks really was like after that launch and what happened in the next two weeks. And that was not necessarily going to happen if I hadn't had um, a couple of conversations basically over those couple of weeks. You At that point, basically, you really understood that this is not something that will get you to uh, making uh, enough money to cover your living cost by six months. And uh, how how did you move away from this? What what happened to steer you in the right direction, or did you just completely abandon it and try something else? Yeah, so I was getting a lot of people signing up, and I was, and I I'd, I'd followed a lot of the rules that I'd set myself in a, in sort of the previous years of sort of failed bootstrapping. So it was, you know, there was a minimum price point of like thirty forty dollars something like that, you know, and it was it was something that wasn't a 
what didn't require other people. One person could sign up and get value straight away. And there didn't have to be like some other side of the marketplace to sort of help them out and all that. Um, but the thing I was still trying to avoid, I think, was actually talking to people, you know, and I was doing a bit of it, but, and I, th I think I'd kind of assumed as well that I'd built something. So therefore that was going to be the product rather than that was kind of pointing away to a product and pointing away to a little bit of, of interest, basically. So I got these 2000 people signed up. Realistically, that's 2000 people who were interested enough in something that sounded like what I was doing that they would give me an email address, right? And we, we all know that no one reads anything on the internet. So they just see reports for Trello. They're like, oh, that sounds like exactly what I want. Then they go in and they're like, no, this is not exactly what I want. I'm not going to leave. Um, I, I was sort of sending out an email from there and it was that, um, forgotten the guy's name but it's the um the product market fit survey that people recommend you know like how disappointed would you be if you couldn't use this product anymore and um blah 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 these sort of questions um people should look it up if they if they don't know it it's an interesting one but i was sending that out way too early because i was sending it out for a product that wasn't like was 100 percent not there but i was sending that out i think i was using intercom so that was sort of automated sending that out to everyone at that point um and getting a load of responses that weren't really telling me anything useful, but I was looking at the people who were logging in and I saw like a few email addresses that I knew. So I saw Josh Pigford from Bear Metrics. So I pinged him an email and was like, oh, celebrity sign up. Um, and he, as always, was really, really um, generous and kind and hopped on a call with me in theory so that we could see if we could get the tool working for him and he could sign up as a customer. But pretty much immediately he's like, um, I think I just signed up for this for a play. It doesn't really work for me. Um, and then just gave me 30 minutes of business advice. And the main thing I remember coming away from that with was that I just needed to talk to everyone and not email. It needed to be Skype face to face if possible. Um, so I set out a new email to everyone who was in there and just said, look, um, and I think I used the sort of the approach from the mum test book, you know, kind of, we're trying to really improve reporting for teams using Trello, but you know, I need people like you to tell me what that needs to be. So I'll put them on a pedestal kind of thing. Um, you know, would you have 15 to 20 minutes to spare to, you know, tell me what it is that you need so I can understand what needs to be built, that kind of approach, um, sent that out and then just had lots and lots of conversations for about two, three weeks. Um, some in person went down and met people in Bristol who, um, were sort of showing me what they're working on there. And that was, that was a turning point. And the, like the really important learning for me there was that when you like initially build and launch something like that without, I guess, a lot of the customer development and sort of upfront work that people often do to sort of prove, okay, this is definitely a product people want. When you just kind of build and launch, if you get interest, that interest is probably not in what you've built but it is in something tangential to what you've built and you need to go and have conversations with those people and be like okay you thought i'd built something here hadn't you what was it you thought i'd built or what is it you were hoping that i'd built and if you get enough people telling you the same thing and that they're willing to pay for it then you can go and um go and build that thing and i think that was the, the sort of critical learning for me there is like yes build and launch but then you need to sort of follow up with the, the customers and talk to them and be like or not customers the people who are interested and the people who will give you 30 minutes of their time i mean that's a, a decent barrier to um sort of you know them showing some serious interest um yeah so the, what i learned from that there was two groups there was marketers who are really interested in everything and they just definitely wanted everything and they wanted to try everything and they were going to prove to be the worst customers ever because they didn't really want to use any of the charts. They were just interested in new shit, basically. Um, and software development teams who are great because I came from that background. And the, the sort of revelation there was you've got a head of development or a product manager who really wants all these metrics out of the software development team, but the software development team really likes using Trello. So they've got two options. Either they have to do it manually out of Trello or just give up on getting these metrics and charts or they have to tell the software development team, you're not allowed to use the tool you want to use. You've got to use this other tool that you hate so that I, the boss, can get some numbers out of it. Um, and those people have got money to spend. They're very happy to spend $30, $80 a month if it allows their team to be happy and allows them to get the data they want. Um, and it was a group of people I knew how to talk to and how to find, I guess, as well, importantly. So that was, and then I was sort of heads down, building, 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 because at that point, there was a fairly obvious large um product roadmap that i needed to just kind of get through and there were people i was fairly convinced would um pay money for it super super interesting because it, that shows that 
even though you you didn't succeed with the first product, um, what it got you is is access to people and access to a market, and at least validated there's something there. Um, and from there, you could you could take down the route as if you have had a previous business, as if you had a previous email list, as if you had previous access to somebody, and do the good old customer development. Um, but the key learning here is probably you got to find an audience somehow. Yes. Yeah. No. That is um, that is absolutely true. And getting. I mean, I think with things like product hunt is. I mean, it can be quite hit and miss still. I think maybe I was quite lucky in the, the sort of first few things they put on there. So I would go around, I was just like telling everyone, oh, just stick it on Product Hunt and you'll get like a load of stuff. But then I've subsequently had ones on there that languish at 30 all day long and you're like, okay, um, not so exciting. But you can you can put stuff out there and yeah, you get that audience. But then yeah, it's definitely that thing that you need to treat that as an audience to do some development work with rather than just like immediately sell to, you know, you need to go and understand what it is that they're, they're after. And if you were a bit more of a, build it and launch it quick, which I, I still like. Um, and I know a lot of people smarter than me don't like it. And they say you should do a lot of customer development and questions up front, and you should never even write any code until you know what you're building. But I think if you can build a prototype in 24 hours, you know, and you can get something releasable or like shareable within a week and releasable to the world within four to six weeks, it's kind of like, why not go that route, you know, um, if there's, if that will then allow you to collect this audience, like you say, that you can then go and do the work with. On was the product growing? Did you have customers signing up? Can we say that by six months, you were fairly confident that this is the product you want to be building? By six months, I was confident it was a product I wanted to be building. I was also confident that I was going to spend pretty much all of the money that I had um, getting it right. So there was, and this was, again, I mean, like the emotional state of that first year was, was very strange because you just, every single month you're spending money, um, and also not earning the money that I could be earning. It's like, you know, CTO somewhere like this. So it's part of you is like, what the hell am I doing? And part of you is like, this is all I've ever wanted. This is great. And it feels like this is going to work. You know, I'm getting, um, like the typical feedback I might get then that I really loved was somebody be like, I can't believe you're trying to charge $30 for this. It doesn't even have a cumulative flow diagram in it. And you're like, so if I had a cumulative flow diagram in it, you'd pay $30. And they're like, yeah. And you're like, great. That's what I'm going to build next week. And then you'd release that and they would become a customer. So I was getting, it's that real thing people talk about where the market sort of pulls the product out of you. Once I, um, once I changed the landing page and changed how I talked about it and put like, I put the first thing in was just a burn down chart, um, which is sort of a common chart used by agile development teams. And then I would, um, it would go out there, people would sign up and they'd be like, oh, well, you know, all this does is burn down charts. I, I really need cycle time. You know, somebody would get on with me, but people had a real problem. They'd be really happy to get on a call with me and be like, look, Robin, I like what you're doing. It's a nice product, but I really need a CFD and a cycle time chart um, for my team. But I've got a team of 70 engineers. I would quite happily pay $160 a month for this. But, you know, unless it's got those in, I'm not going to pay because it doesn't give me what I need. But I really want you to do it because I don't want to have to tell my team that they have to move to Jira, which they all hate. Um, so people will be very happy to get on a call. And I think there's an element there of um, you make the marketing very clear of um, in the product of what you're trying to do. So they're like, they're like, well, this is meant to be for me. It's just not doing it. Um, and then sort of emailing out so every, every week, probably I was launching new stuff. So you email out to the list and say, Hey, we just released this. We just released this. And I think there's probably an email that went out on like day one or day two of their trial saying, you know, um, you know, automated, but from me, you know, um, plain text email being like, Hey, how are you finding it? Is there any feedback? Is there anything you want? You know, I'm working as fast as I can to build this thing. So people would get in touch and it was, so it was really clear. There were people who really wanted this were very willing to pay a sensible amount of money for it, um, which is not always guaranteed, right? Um, and it was kind of a case of filling in the, the product gaps. And I could I could see it, you know, if, if I sort of maybe like a couple of weeks work on one feature, launch it, I would get, yeah, a couple of customers off of that launch who had been waiting for it. And then you would see like the next week instead of, you know, probably one customer a week, suddenly it's two customers a week or signing up, or, you know, it's like, it's three every two weeks now, rather than two every three. And you'd see like each feature was genuinely um, building up to it. So it took me like the rest of that year then to get 
to product market fit probably in terms of just the, the raw functionality that was in there. Um, and during that time, I think I made a grand total of about a thousand dollars, um, which is not a lot. So we were at the end of that year, we were three months away from running out of, or maybe it might've only been two months away from completely running out of cash on something where the MRR was not really that close to covering expenses. Um, yeah, but that was sort of the story through to the end of the year, basically. And so you, you, you essentially you see this light at the end of the tunnel, especially when it comes to, to higher paying customers, right? You, you're like, okay, they will sign up. They will give me 160, whatever, 100, $200 a month, yeah. but I need this entire list of features. Uh, is, is this the point where you decide, okay, I need, I need some help. We can get there, but I need some help. That was a lot later. Yeah. At that point, it was just me. And there was, there was no money coming out of the business basically. Um, and I was still just living off of savings. So it was another year before I got anyone else in. Um, and that was, there wasn't the, um, month to month revenue to cover their costs, but there was a bit of cash in the bank. And I was confident that with them on board, I would grow the revenue and cover their costs basically. Um, yeah, but at this point, it was still just me building features out as fast as I could, basically. Yeah, so and during that year, even though you probably weren't able to cover them fully, uh, that must have still been quite some rapid growth if uh, your MRR was below 1,000 before, and then so it started picking up. Was yeah, so what, of the... so what happened? So I'd been struggling with... Um, building, building, building. And I had, um, and obviously doing some marketing as well. And most of the marketing was around, um, content and SEO really. Um, so I, I was doing, um, yeah, I, you know, probably my best blog post I did back then was a tutorial on how to build your own dashboard using the Trello API. Um, and then that I could then take to, I can't remember what it was, but there was some big code website where I sort of did a write up of that for them as a tutorial and link back to my site. Um, so I'd get a lot of people landing on that. And it was obviously some developers on a, you know, they've got a free day at work and their bosses said, oh, we need some charts out of Trello. Can you go and have a look? They Google it, I come up, they go to my site, they see how they can build it, but it takes them all afternoon to get started. And then they're like, oh, well, we could just buy the software instead. Um, so that was, it was bits and bobs like that, but it was very, very slow, um, very slow growth. Trello at the time had no kind of a directory. They had a, a Trello board, obviously, of integrations, which was just this like, I don't know, this graveyard of like abandoned projects, you know, developer side projects or stuff somebody had worked a weekend on and then forgotten about three years ago. So I was listed on that. Um, and towards the end of the year, I, it was becoming apparent. I got the product I think I needed, but the efforts I was putting in onto marketing were were stumbling basically i was getting some kind of trickle of traffic in but as, as it always is like the sort of slow sass ramp of death they call it doesn't it just getting those things moving at any kind of pace takes a long time but then trello came to me and said oh we're launching third-party power-ups so they had power-ups and i think they had you know calendar and custom fields and a few like this but they said we're going to open it up and um, would you like to be in the sort of first batch and gave me maybe three weeks notice on that so i quickly sort of hacked something together so i could have a power up notionally working and was they sort of put the launch out in January I think it was so it was I think it was Dropbox um a bunch of other companies you've heard of and me um and that was it in the sort of first batch and that got me really good exposure then and obviously because Trello had launched this thing there was a lot of promotion around hey go and check out this um I was managing to get a few more blog posts with the Trello team then who were very kind and sort of supporting me in my efforts to get things moving a little bit but mostly all of the traffic came from being in the directory at that point and that was where everything turned around and i think i met you that year because was it was that in barcelona yeah yeah that's right and that so at the start of that year i was like six weeks away from having to get a job and then the the revenue started coming in a bit faster and it basically the the runway was six weeks, then the next month it was still six weeks, then it was seven weeks, then it was eight, and it just sort of the runway started stretching out a little bit with the cash. 
And then MicroConf came up and I was like, well, I can afford to go to MicroConf this year. I sort of told myself I wouldn't go until I had a business that was making money. Um, so yeah, I turned up to MicroConf with a business that was paying me the two and a half grand I needed a month for me and my family to live on. And yeah, was the happiest I'd been ever, probably professionally at least. Um, yeah, and that, that was it. And at that point, I've got to admit, I kind of took my foot off the um, pedal on marketing. I've subsequently come back to it and tried to work out how to get some other things going, but just being in a directory was kind of all you needed to do. And obviously, you know, there's only like seven power ups in a directory or something. So you were massively discoverable. Um, yeah. And that, that year was good growth then. So, uh, how did you, how did you scale from there? You, you have, you found a growth channel, which is mostly the thing that it, it, it takes, right? You, you yeah. don't necessarily, especially at the beginning, need 20 of those. You found your growth channel, at least for now, and you wanted to focus back, put the focus back on the product. Yes. How, how did that go from there? And I'm trying to dredge my memory up of what happened during that year. So there was still a lot of building and technical debt and scaling issues, things like this. So I think I was going through a lot of that that year. Um, and it was, it must be towards the end of that year, I had, yeah, managed to build up a bit of cash in the bank. And this is when I started thinking about getting another developer involved. So I've like, like a lot of entrepreneurs, I guess, a sort of a generalist and kind of enjoy being a generalist and learning new stuff. But I have to 100% admit like I'm not a front end developer. So I taught myself react and a bit of JavaScript to build that, um, that product. But I was like, this is not a great job that's been done here. And it looked fair where well, it looked awful in a lot of places. And I was like, I, you know, this is where I'm weakest and I don't have time now to learn how to do this and get good at it. So I wanted somebody who could take on the front end. In the end, I managed to find um, a really good full stack developer who's excellent on the front end and also um, all of my back end technologies. So he started taking a lot of work there and the two of us were working in, in parallel building out. And I, I got to say, I'm trying to remember what we were even building out then, cause it feels like it should have been done, but there was obviously a bunch of improvements. I think it was basically, you know, there's a question of if you've got this chart or that chart that would get people to sign up. But then when people get in, they're like, oh, I kind of need it to do this. I needed to do that. And I think there's sort of a lot of those niceties and improvements around that kind of stuff. And a, a bunch of scaling issues. I mean, throughout both of those years, like when I initially launched and had like the 2000 people sign up, the scaling issue then was I calculated, I did all the report calculations in one go and it would have taken two weeks to recalculate everyone's reports for them on the Monday. So I think like quickly change how all that worked on the weekend. And that's kind of been the tail all the way through. It's like, it's always been built to the level of scale it was operating at at that point. And then three months later, we'll be like, okay, now we need to go and fix this, fix that. Um, and we started building out some other power ups as well that year, but mostly, uh, we just built one. That was a free one, which Trello got in touch and said, Hey, everyone wants story points. Maybe you could build that. So we built that as like a freebie, um, a kind of a lead magnet for our, our main product. There, um, when we were, were talking about how you got started and you didn't have an audience, uh, you, you weren't able to do customer development before building something. Now you do, now you have an audience. Now we have lots of people signing up, coming your way. You have your marketing channel. Um, how did you identify your, your next product opportunity? Yeah. So, I mean, the next big one was blue cat reports, which you launched a couple a year ago now, I guess, and started work on, um, about two years ago. And it, it sort of just comes naturally from chatting to people. So you get in on doing demo calls with people who ask for them, or, you know, it'd make it fairly easy for people to sign up for a call with me if they wanted it. And I would, you know, offer them all the time with anyone who got in touch with any questions. Um, and you just start going through your product with people and you realize like, you're a really terrible fit for my products. You do not you do not want my product, but you think you do. And you've got some problems which are kind of close to my product. And again, it's that sort of thing. These people are signing because they think it does something else or they hope it does something else. And it's something tangential to what you do. And you could make your product do that. But I was looking at mine and with Corello, I was very much, this is for Scrum and Kanban teams who are serious about how they do Scrum and Kanban. And we do everything sort of by the book. Um, 
And there was a bunch of people signing up because it was kind of the only reporting solution in town for Trello and desperately trying to make it work for themselves. But just you'd get on and you'd have to explain what all these charts did. And most of the time it wasn't what they wanted. So it's fairly obvious there was a need for like some general purpose reporting for Trello, which Trello have also realized and launched um, just in the last couple of months, which is really great timing after I launched mine <laughs> last year. But there you go. Um, so it's that kind of thing. And again, it's sort of the product, the market kind of pulling it out of you, I guess, a little bit and just, um, just constant exposure to people using your product and realizing, yes, I mean, maybe, maybe that is not the case for everyone. Um, but because I was in this niche in Trello where at the time there were a lot less solutions in Trello, people would get in touch and be like, Hey, you're the only person who seems to be doing anything close to what we want. You know, can we talk about what I need? So it would, it was became fairly obvious. There was opportunity there with people who had time to invest and you've got to assume would convert if you had the product they wanted, basically. There's a bunch of other like free ones, mostly sort of lead magnet kind of things. So last year we finally, something I've wanted to do since the start, this um, Trello annual report. So it's kind of like the Spotify wrapped kind of idea. So you connect it to your Trello board and then it gives you a load of like stats. So you get the Usain Bolt award for like the fastest card completion. You get like gold, silver, bronze, and you get some numbers like, oh, your team completed 700 cards last year. 200 of them were completed in under 24 hours. And, you know, not nothing you're going to take to a board meeting, but like a bit of fun to sort of share around and some like some good news stories. So there's bits and bobs like that. And then obviously what happens in there is there's a little advert for like, you know, hey, do you want good reporting? Check out Blue Cat Reports. Um, and so and we launched another one last year called Burndowns, which is a, another paid one. That was sort of an experiment in we've built this kind of now that I've got developers working on stuff full time rather than me just hacking stuff together. We've actually built some infrastructure to make it easy to roll out new power ups. Um, so Burndowns is kind of an experiment in what if we just took this one feature out of Corello and just did it as a standalone, but better than any anyone has done a Burndown implementation for Trello yet and see what happens with that. Um, and that allows us to experiment with pricing and some other things that we wanted to try there. Um, but Corello and Blue Cat Reports are the, the biggies really and the sort of the main, the main focus for us. Um, yeah. So you just mentioned it's, it's more than you now, obviously. Uh, what, what is your team setup currently? So got me, got a one full-time full stack developer, one, um, three days a week ish, although it's kind of up to him, um, front end developer and designer. And just as of a month ago, six weeks ago, hired customer support person who works, um, around two hours a day, two to four hours a day. Um, as required, basically. And she's excellent. She picks up calls during the day between other jobs that she's on. So as far as the customers are concerned, it looks like we get eight hours of customer support, but actually I pay for about two hours of it um, across the time. And that has been an absolute life saver recently because I, I just moved house recently. Um, so I was just AFK for maybe a week um, and I would pop in occasionally on the evenings, but there would be like a good sort of two, two days at a time, three days at a time where nobody would hear from me. And she was handling the vast majority of stuff. And then there would be a couple of calls that I'd get in. So I'd get back in and we'd get, I'd get completely up to speed and I could get on with my work again by lunchtime. Whereas normally if that had happened, I would have like a week of sorting through, um, yeah, customer support and everything else that had built up basically. So yeah, that's the sort of core team. Then there's like freelancers doing, um, server maintenance and stuff like this for us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like with the pandemic, there was like zero impact. Everyone was already working at home anyway. Um, in terms of zero impact in, in that way. Anyway, I was, yeah, I was in an office in Bristol, which I stopped going into, but yeah, distributed around the, the world a little bit. Yeah. What, what, what geographic areas? So I've got one guy who's actually not that far from me now that I've moved. Um, so he's probably a couple hundred miles from me here in the UK. Um, one developer in Poland and then went for Canada for customer support specifically for that. So I, basically, so I can ignore customer support requests when they come in in the evening and just know that someone's going to look at them. Um, but yeah, so that was on the that's... East Coast probably. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That helps. Nice. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, we did that for the sort of, so we could have a bit of crossover at sensible times for both of us, um, which was important in the early days. That was an interesting experience for me, sort of hiring her. So I went through WeWork remotely for that. And I put a very vague job post in there, just like, hey, you can be anywhere, any kind of North American time zone. Um, and yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then just got absolutely floored with applications. Um, cause I guess my background is hiring software developers in the UK when I had a job, that was what I was trying to do. And it was just impossible to find, get more than three or four people to come in for an interview basically. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of applications from that and then started being like, okay, if you're not East coast, then your application's going in the bin, um, et cetera. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing these insights. Um, what is, what is next for you? Uh, like on a short, short midterm basis, what, what are you working on? What's exciting ahead? Yeah. So we are continuing to push on blue cat reports. So there's still, um, there's still some feature, uh, feature gaps there, but we were, we were largely where we wanted to be in terms of product market fit at launch, I would say last year, which is a difference with Corello, um, we did, we spent a lot longer building it rather than just pushing it straight out there. Um, but what we're really trying to focus on there now is the sort of conversion rates, you know, that sort of whack-a-mole game on all of the, the funnel metrics, basically. So trying to really, really ramp that up this year and get some better numbers there and more focus on marketing. Like I say, we sort of relied quite heavily on being in the marketplace and do a pretty good job of marketing within the marketplace. But I want to really start digging into some other marketing channels that we've, we've investigated and played with in the past. But I think because I've been doing all the customer support and I've been involved in dev and everything like this, and I'm kind of pulling myself out of that now, I'm like, okay, I can either focus on marketing or not. If not, then I can hire someone to do it. Maybe is uh, the way to go, but yeah, it's all blue cat. Um, I'm really optimizing that this year and I'm excited to see how much we can grow that. Awesome. So where, where can people find you and your, in your products? Where should they go? Yeah. Um, I'm at Robin Warren on Trello on a, on Trello on Twitter. That's the easiest place to find me there. Um, and the products are all in the Trello power up directory. If you search reporting, you'll find blue cat and Corello, um, and probably all the others as well. Yeah. If people want to go to cherrywoodsoftware.com, they can see the really, really terrible logo that I designed for the company, which my design is upset about. <laughs> but um, no one sees it, really, because we don't use it anywhere. But people can check out my artistic skills there if they want. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been really helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for being on the show. Cool. Thanks for having me on. Really interesting chatting with you. Cheers.